So my name's Brenna Bell. I'm the staff attorney with BARC. Um, I'm a lifelong Cascadian. I grew up uh, just at the base of Mount Rainier and Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest. And that's where I got a lot of my inspiration to do forest activism. Um, right outside of the Mount Baker Snoqualmie Forest is a vast warehouser land holdings, private land, which in my childhood I observed to get clear cut um, in phenomenally devastating ways. And uh, as I aged and became even more invested in my environment and ecosystem, and decided really to focus on forests. That was just the time that the salvage writer, was, was this awful writer in 1996, got passed in Congress. It was an appropriations writer tacked to the Oklahoma bombing victims uh, aid package. So it was a bill that could not not pass. And Congress, in the wake of the Northwest Forest Plan, where there was a lot of collaborative work to create good forest policy, decided to eviscerate a lot of that by attaching a rider to this bill that exempted forests in the Northwest from almost all environmental laws. It exempted forests that had been affected by fire or insects or might be affected by fire or insects. Well, what forest isn't in the category of might be affected by forests or insects? So a lot of the good work of the Northwest Forest Plan was undone by the salvage rider. That was right as I was graduating college and I was appalled. And I was like, ugh. The law is supposed to protect us. It failed. I guess I'm going to have to go to the forest. And I became a direct action forest activist. And I'm afraid of heights, so I didn't <laughs> do too good as a tree sitter or in the blockades. So I became much more of a town support. And I helped organize support at this time. Um, the big timber sale we were focused on in this area was the Eagle Creek timber sale in the Mount Hood National Forest. That was right outside of Estacada. So in 1997, I got involved in that. And uh, that led me to the, you know, good or bad decision to go to law school to learn the legal tool. So this couldn't happen again that all of our laws would be removed. And I went to law school at Lewis and Clark. And since then, in one way or another, I've been working with law, policy, and organizing um, and combining those three things with a focus on federal forests in Oregon. Uh, I've been at BARC for three years, which is great. It was kind of like homecoming to come back to the organization that was birthed out of the campaign to save Eagle Creek. Um, and I'm working now with a lot of people that I was in the woods then, which is, which is a real gift. So that's a little bit about how I came to BARC. And BARC is an amazing grassroots organization that focuses on really getting people out into the forest and uh, seeing on the ground what's going on in our public lands, bringing people to the public lands, and then speaking truth to the agencies and the federal government as they're making decisions on what to do with our public lands. That's something that's one of Bark's strengths, and at the end of this talk, I'll be telling you all about opportunities to get you out in the forest to participate in that. Um, but I'm going to do a, a digression before I get into the now, because there's something that has really kind of come up for me a lot as we're talking about our public lands. And I've thought, you know, as the child of, of settlers, my ancestors came over on the Oregon Trail, I thought, how did these lands become our public lands? Like, what's the history that has now the federal government managing the forests of the Cascades? And after doing a lot of historical research and piecing it together, I've kind of come up with a story, and I want to tell you the story of how Mount Hood National Forest became federal land that now, quote unquote, belongs to all Americans. So first my question, before European settlement, who lived here? Americans. Which ones? A lot of different tribes, really. Mm -hmm. Let's think of the land that is now Mount Hood National Forest. We had the Clackamas, who are Chinook, the Kalapuya. Those are mostly the Willamette Valley, the northern Willamette Valley tribes. And then along the north side of the mountain, the Columbia River tribes, there were the Wasco and the Wishram people. And they were the tribes that mostly lived in and around the lowlands. Most people didn't live up in the forest. They would go up there for hunting. But those were the tribes pre-settlement. So that's how it was. Then came a massive wave of mostly European ancestry settlement. Now, how did the land shift into their hands? Anybody? And you know, the federal government had a big hand in this. In, 19, in, in 1850, the Federal Congress passed something called the Oregon Donation Land Claims Act. 
And in 1850, a lot of the land had already been settled, but there wasn't any official way to grant title to the people who had settled it. So Congress passed the act. Uh, it, its explicit purpose was to encourage European settlement in Oregon. It granted 320 acres to any male of European descent who wanted to who was 18 or older and wanted to homestead, have a permanent homestead. If you were married, the couple got 640 acres. And mostly it was done to retroactively validate land claims that had already been taken. So the, let's see, what, how many, I'll look at my notes. Right, a provision of the law granted half of that amount to anybody between 1850 and 1854, but mostly it was retroactively applied to validate the claims of people who had already come. Now, who were the people giving the land away? It was the federal government. Well, how did they get the land to give it away? This is an interesting question. I was like, how did they do that? So before Congress could pass the Oregon Donation Land Claims Act, they had to extinguish native title. So they made a point of extinguishing native title by entering into negotiation with all of the different tribes. And the negotiation went like this. You agree to move off your land or we'll kill you. So it, there was debate amongst the tribes if you read the history, but most of them agreed to move off of their land. And the land was specifically chosen because it was undesirable for white settlement. And that's what happened with the creation of the Silets, the Grand Ronde, and the Warm Springs reservations. So tribes, disparate tribes from all over the region, all got moved into these three reservations from the Columbia down to the Rogue Valley. That consolidation happened. So that was the effective extinguishing of Indian title. And after the Donation Land Claims Act, all of that land got passed to the General Land Office, which was newly created in 1850 by the federal government to dispose of the land that it had acquired when extinguished title. I've got a quote says, remove the tribes, quote, to, and leave the whole of the most desirable portions open to white settlers. So they chose areas that were inaccessible by rivers and unsuitable for agriculture. That's gross. It's, it's a depressing history. It really is. Um, so that removal policy opened up millions of acres to be transferred to what they called bona fide settlers. So that was the main purpose of the United States government at the time was not to hold the land, but to dispose of it. So after Indian title was extinguished, the General Land Office would issue a final certificate, and they passed over 7,000 of these certificates, the smallest of them being around 300 acres. So that got rid of a lot of the land in the Willamette Valley. So land that did not transfer to private holdings in that time remained with the General Land Office. It was held by the federal government. So around that time in the late 1880s, 1890s, there was actually a growing budding conservation movement. And it was the time that it shifted, the land policy in the federal government shifted to disposing of the land to retaining the land, and actually with an eye to conservation. So this again is stuff that centered in Oregon. You know, there's, there's a lot of Oregon's history that we have been the, quote, pioneers on, good and bad. So in this, we're moving into the, the, better, the better feeling piece, piece of it. So riding this wave of growing conservation awareness, President Grover Cleveland was the first person by executive order to suspend homesteading and designate a forest reserve. And the first forest reserve in Oregon was around Crater Lake. It was between the like Diamond Lake, Crater Lake area, and it was also this withdrawal that led to the first Oregon National Park, which was Crater Lake in 1902. But stepping back to the 1890s, there was legislation in Congress in 1891 that allowed the president to create forest reserves, where it reserved the forest for the good of all. The first use of the forest reserves in Oregon under that new act, does anyone know? It's pretty cool. We are direct beneficiaries from this move. It is the Bull Run. Henry Failing, whom Failing Straits named after, was the chair of the Portland Water Supply at the time, and he used that clout to get the Bull Run designated as Oregon's first forest reserve in, see, in 1892, and it covered 140,000 acres. And then the Cascade Range Forest Reserve was created in 1893. This was the largest forest reserve in the country. It was the entire Cascade Range. 
of Oregon. It was 4,400,000 acres and 235 mile, miles in length. So the whole Cascade Range was reserved as this federal forest reserve. And the idea of the reserve was not that it would be used, but that it would be reserved for conservation purposes. That was in, let's see, where are we? Uh, 1893. So with this conservation ethic, can you imagine what happened? Pushback. There was a lot of pushback. They were like, wait, the entire Cascade Range just got reserved. And at that time, there weren't timber interests who were really invested in the Cascade Range. It was uh, sheep herders, miners, and local homesteaders who pushed back on the forest reserve. And actually, the entire Oregon delegation was ready to just throw in the towel and cancel the whole forest reserve. There's, there's an amazing story of grassroots organizing that led to the reserve staying intact in Congress. So we have this large forest reserve. But then comes the creation of the Forest Service. Unfortunately, this also comes from Oregon. So Oregon Senator Charles W. Fulton in 1905 pushed forward a bill to change the name of the forest reserves to national forests and to remove the idea of the conservation ethic for a utilization ethic. So the forest reserves one by one became national forests who were housed in the uh, Department of Agriculture, which is different. The General Land Office had been in the Department of the Interior, but when the National Forests were created, they moved to the Department of Agriculture, which has had a lot to do with the way forests have been looked at ever since. So that was you know, a good 20 years almost after the conservation started, it kind of got breaks, pushed back, and changed direction to become more of utilized forests. So after that transfer of federal forests to the Forest Service in 1905, the Bull Run Forest Reserve became Bull Run National Forest, and then the Cascade Forest Reserve got broken up into several different forests. The northern portion was known as the Oregon National Forest, and then the southerly portions became what they're now known as, as Willamette, Umpqua, and Siskiyou. So it wasn't until, I think, in 1924, the Oregon Forest merged with the Bull Run Forest, and they became what we now know as Mount Hood National Forest. So that's just a little history that I think is really telling about how that land that we now refer to as our public land shifted in its nature from land that was related to by use rights only from the native people to being land you know, in the great land grab in the settlements to being reserved with conservation purposes to being turned into the national forest with a multiple use focus that we still have to deal with today. So you might be wondering, what happened to the general land office? Where did they go? And what about all the land that didn't get disposed of to settlers or turned into forest reserves? Well, that land stayed in the general land office. Have you all ever heard of the general land office? Right, it's not around anymore because in the 1930s, the General Land Office merged with what was then known as the Taylor Grazing Service, which mostly dealt with the Intermountain West grazing rights, and the two of them became the Bureau of Land Management. The Bureau of Land Management is in the Department of the Interior, where the General Land Office had been housed, and even though in some ways it's a sister management agency to the Forest Service, it comes from a very different history and different mandates. And Oregon has a very um, interesting and special relationship with the BLM in terms of forestry, which I'll get to later. We get to talk about the Oregon-California Lands Act, which is this weird little act that causes all sorts of havoc to forests, especially in southern Oregon. But that's where the birth of the BLM came from. So now we know a little bit about how the land got to where it was. And uh, now we'll talk about how it's managed and what directs the different management. Most of the land that Bark watches is under the Forest Service, you know, Mount Hood National Forest. What factors are at play in the management of a federal forest? We're going to step back and do some kind of basic politics, talking about the three branches of government, which are? Legislative. Legislative. And what does a legislative branch do? The legislative branch makes the laws. Now, who implements the laws? Second branch. The executive branch implements the laws made by the legislative branch. And if we're disagreeing over how those laws are implemented, who makes the call? The 
the judicial branch. So every branch is at play when we're talking about federal lands management. Um, and every piece of, every step of that are points of intervention, which we'll also get to. But for the, for the main purposes, what we work with a lot is the laws that have been created and then the administration of them. The judicial branch comes into play, and for, for myself as a lawyer, I have more engagement than that as many, but it's the executive and the legislative branches where BARC and most environmental groups who do this kind of work and uh, people who are really interested in this have their engagement. And in Oregon, recently, the main discussion around federal forest policy has been about economics. It's been about jobs, and it's been about payments to counties from timber. Now, remember how I talked about federal forests all up and down the Cascades? They're national forests. Now, in a system that is dependent on property taxes, like a lot of Oregon is, we're dependent on property taxes, what happens to a county when a lot of its land is held by the federal government who doesn't pay property taxes? Yeah, it doesn't get much money from property taxes. So this has long been an issue in mostly rural counties who are dependent on their land base to give them money to operate. Now, one of the things the Forest Service has done is traditionally give 25% of all of its timber receipts to the county that it's housed in. So the local county, the local government, makes money from logging on federal public lands. And there's a twist I'll just touch on. There's a, a whole new trend of something called stewardship contracting, where the agency works with timber companies to do more goods for services, and all the money stays on the district, and the counties don't get any of it. They don't like this. They don't like this one bit because many counties have developed to be completely dependent on timber dollars coming in. So there was a great decrease in the amount of timber dollars coming to counties in the 1990s. And many counties, especially in southern Oregon, suffered because of that. Um, and again, we'll get into that more when we talk about the Oregon-California Lands Act and what's going on. But economics plays a big role. Jobs, like specific jobs in the timber industry, not so much anymore. There was a huge mechanization of the industry at the same time when the cut decreased. And so the mechanization has actually been the biggest killer of jobs, not necessarily the lack of logging. The, the timber company would love to, to blame it on the environmentalists. You know, up in Washington where I'm from, there were signs that say, you know, like, shoot a spotted owl, or spotted owl tastes like chicken, or that's a good one. Or hug a logger, you'll never go back to trees. Um, a lot of anti-environmental sentiment, sentiment, but in reality, most of the jobs at that time were being lost to a huge mechanization of the industry. And so in Oregon, jobs in the lumber industry and milling are a very small percent of where we get our money. Even with the federal forests, much more is generated by recreation. But there's a myth that it's a really big piece of Oregon's economy. And that myth plays a bigger role in forest policy than the actual role that it plays in the economy. That myth is very strong. Um, so we've got the payments to counties, the jobs, and the myth of jobs. And then the, another way that economics really shows up in forest policy goes back to the legislative, and that's that Congress sets the budget for the administrative agencies. So Congress makes the laws that the administrative agencies implement. It also sets the budget and allocates how much they get for what. So at the end of the day, honestly, I'm coming to learn that the, maybe the best thing I could do as a forest activist is learn how the budgeting process works, which I never thought I'd say because it sounds really boring. But that's where a lot of the power is. Because if we could change what Congress was telling the agencies to spend money on, it would change the policy. It would just have the, you know, the trickle-down effect of getting what we want to come out on the ground because the appropriations bill looked different. So those are all things to think about as we're approaching what's actually happening. Like, what are all the different pieces of policy, law, and economics that guide, you know, the jazz timber sale that's happening on the ground? Now I'm going to get into the laws specifically. This is, this is where your alphabet soup 
sheet comes in. All right, I'm not gonna go over all of them. You can read it later in the leisure of your own home. And uh, if you're watching this, I, I'll do my best to get my alphabet soup list up on the BARC website too. But I wanna talk about kind of the na nature of the different laws and then which ones apply the most and what they mean. So there's a lot. <clears throat> there's some federal environmental law that apply to all the land, no matter what its designation is. Think of things like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. It doesn't matter if it's BLM land, it doesn't matter if it's private land, it doesn't matter if it's Forest Service land, they all have to comply with the Clean Water Act. All have to comply with the Endangered Species Act. It might show up a little bit different, but it's not a, a land designated specific one. But some depend on what designation the land is. There's the National Forest Management Act that's just about how you manage a national forest. There's the Federal Land Policy and Management Act that's just about how you manage Bureau of Land Management lands. Then there's the National Parks has its own whole suite of lands that I don't pay attention to because mostly national parks are protected, thankfully, it's great. But those are really specific to what type of land you're working with. So whenever you're coming at an issue, you have to think like, how is this land designated? Like we live in a time where every inch of the map is designated in some way. Every piece of ground has title to it. There's nothing that anymore that is, you know, just its own. <laughs> you can always trace it back and be like, who owns this land? Who manages this land? And what are the regulations controlling their management? Which can be helpful if a little cumbersome. So that's you want to think about what type of land is it and then what laws apply. And one thing about a lot of those kind of broad overreaching laws, they were all passed in the same time period. You all know who the most environmental president we've had is ever since Teddy Roosevelt? Nixon. Yes, Richard Nixon, 1970s. Amazing things happened in the early 1970s in the realm of environmental law. Sweeping, uh, ambitious laws got passed. That's when the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Envi Endangered Species Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act, which is one that I'll speak to, all got passed. And all of them were incredibly ambitious. If you read their kind of congressional intent and their implementing language, like the Clean Water Act was intended to end pollution, end water pollution in the United States in the 1970s. It's amazing to read. It's really sad to see what's happened with it. You know, it turned into an act to permit pollution in some ways. Um, but Richard Nixon, bless his little heart, was forced because of a very active movement, people's movement, to pass these laws. So that's great. And of these laws, there's kind of two types. Like I said before, there were the ones that apply to all the land or just some designations. There's also substantive laws and procedural laws. So the substantive laws say, you can do this on this piece of land, or you can't do this. And then the procedural laws say, if you want to do this thing, this is how you have to do it. We're not going to tell you whether or not you can do the thing, just you have to follow this process to do it. And it's kind of unfortunate that one of the tools environmentalists use the most is purely procedural. And that's NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, which is both like the heart and bane of my existence, it's NEPA. What, and have any of you engaged with NEPA before? All right, so I have to, I have to say a little bit about it was. Bark used to do an entire training just on NEPA, which we don't do anymore because its usefulness unfortunately is um, ebbing. But it is a kind of cool law. It basically says you can do anything, federal government, you can do anything. We're not gonna tell you what you can and can't do to the environment, but in the interest of protecting the environment, making informed decisions, and telling the public what's going on, you have to analyze the impacts of your actions and create space for public notice and comment about it. So NEPA was transformational. It was one of those sunshine laws that basically said if the federal government's taking a major federal action, that will have a significant impact on the environment, it has to disclose all of those impacts. Not only that, it has to solicit public input 
doesn't say that he has to listen to public input, but he has to solicit public input, and it gives you the chance to make your voice heard about things. So since, I think it was passed in 1972, NEPA has just really transformed the way information is created around environmental impacts. Yes? Who decided what constituted a major oh. impact, and how big did those public hearings Yes, that is a great question. What's a major act? And um, also a big one is what is a significant impact? Yeah. And then how much public input? These are all things that people in my field of environmental law have litigated extensively. There is a massive body on law on what defines major federal action or significant impact. Um, it wasn't well defined in the statute itself, which is job creation for environmental lawyers. Uh, but the, the federal government, mostly it's a major impact if the federal government is a major player in it. So when we're looking at things like management decisions on national forest lands, it's really easy. The, the Forest Service is the actor. That's the, the federal government's the actor. A lot of the confusion comes you know, around like Department of Transportation things. There can be confusion. Is it state? Is it federal? Like, what's the nexus? And a lot of times they look at who makes the decisions, where the money comes from, to decide if there's enough federal involvement to, that, that it wouldn't happen without the federal government, therefore it has to follow NEPA. So if something would happen without the federal government, it's usually considered not a major federal action. That one is, it can be fairly easily definable. Significant impact though, oh my goodness. There is so much disagreement on what a significant impact is. The current trend in all national forest management, basically that nothing has a significant impact unless it's something totally out of the ordinary to what they usually do. So it used to be that timber sales were considered to be significant. You know, 15 years ago, the jazz timber sale that Bark has been working on a lot, it's 2,000 acre timber sale, all in areas designated as reserved for riparian areas or late successional areas, rebuilds 12 miles of road, has all these disturbance factors. 15 years ago, it would have been considered significant. It would have had an environmental impact statement, which is a very thorough analysis of impacts. But there's been a steady erosion of NEPA analysis over time. Now, it is considered, it, they make what's called a FONSI, just one of those great acronyms, finding of no significant impact. So the Forest Service says, no, there's no significant impact. Business as usual, we've done this all the time. It's fine, it's cool. You know, 2,000 acres, logging, road building, not significant. And then up comes groups like Barth that said, hey, we've been in the forest. We've walked all those acres. We found all these things you didn't see. We've hired an expert hydrologist who disagrees with your analysis on how much sediment is going to go into the watershed. And under NEPA, we get to tell you all of this because we think it's going to have a significant impact. You should prepare an environmental impact statement and actually thoroughly review these things. And the Forest Service, Mount Hood National Forest, has a, has a tendency to say, oh, Bark, that's real nice. No, we're not going to listen to anything you said. We like our plan, and it's not significant. So actually, a lot of the... A debate back and forth between public interest groups and the government around NEPA is whether or not something's significant. The only time since I've been working for BARC that we saw the agency um, actively begin the process of preparing an environmental impact statement saying something was actually significant is when they wanted to put in that 40 mile Palomar pipeline, a liquefied natural gas pipeline through Na Mount Hood National Forest which would have you know, they only found it significant because they would have had to amend major parts of their own forest plan to allow it to happen. So there's a lot of debate on that question. But for the most part, agencies want to do the least amount of analysis possible, and we push for the most amount of analysis possible, and therein lies a lot of the tension and a lot of the litigation. So that's, I'm gonna pause and have a sip. Advertise bark while I do it. Mm. Those are the two main types of law, the substantive and the procedural. If I hadn't ridden my bike over, if we were at the bark office, now would be the time when I like whipped out 
the Mount Hood Forest Land Management Plan. And you could see like how it basically prescribes what you can and can't do depending on the smaller breakdowns of land designation inside the national forest. There's a lot of these different lands. Every forest has its own plan where, they, again, you know, like I said, that people love to categorize land and say what you can and can't do on each category. And so we've got the Mount Hood Land and Resource Management Plan. We've got the Northwest Forest Plan, that Clinton 1994 plan that similarly does that, says what you can and can't do. Those are the substantive plans. And they govern how things are done day to day. NEPA is the process. And with all of that, there's the overarching laws like the Endangered Species Act that they have to follow. And I might as well mention the administrative agencies that implement the Endangered Species Act, Fish and Wildlife Service, which deals with non-anadromous fish and all wildlife, and then the National Marine Fishery Service, or NIMFS, which deals with marine life and the sea runs, so all anadromous fish like salmon. So I know this is a little complicated, but if the Forest Service wants to do something, they're like, oh gosh, you know, like jazz, we're going to put 19 tons of sediment into a salmon-bearing watershed. Hey, the Endangered Species Act says we have to consult with the National Marine Fisheries Service and say, National Marine Fisheries Service, are we going to violate the Endangered Species Act by putting all this sediment into this you know, high-quality, threatened salmon habitat? So that's the consultation. They're required to do that consultation. And then the National Marine Fisheries Service reviews the plan and says whether or not the action is going to, is, will have no effect, is it not likely to adversely affect, or is likely to adversely affect the threatened or endangered species. Now, what do you think nymphs said that adding 19 tons of sediment into threatened salmon habitat would do to the salmon? No effect, not likely adversely affect, or likely to adversely affect? I'll say no effect. Oh, they're a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they said it's not likely to adversely affect, which is basically just a rubber stamp on the agency's action. If NIMFS or the Fish and Wildlife Service, if the consulting agencies find that an action is likely to adversely affect, then they get to do some pushback. They get to say, okay, we actually don't want you to build those roads right next to threatened salmon habitat. We're going to push back and say, you can't do that. We're not going to let you what's called take an endangered species. And then they do a biological opinion, which is a much more, it's called formal consultation. It's a much more formal process. Question. Does the Marine and Fish Service get a kickback from the logging actions? They don't. So you might wonder why. Why would they just stamp off on it? Right. That's a great question. Um, and I've often wondered that myself. Why are agency scientists willing to rubber stamp this action that clearly is going to have an adversely effect on the fish? And I don't know that much about their internal politics, but I do know that they have a long history of not fighting the Forest Service. Um, recently, though, there was a fight around stream buffer widths. NIMFS said, you have to increase your no-cut buffers on streams. There are repairing reserves that were designated by the Northwest Forest Plan, two tree widths. But the Forest Service has decided that logging and repairing reserves is really good. They think it's restoration. We can get more into the science of that later. But they said, oh, well, it's OK. It's, we're restoring the reserves by logging. We're just going to have a 50-foot no-cut buffer by the streams. This was not what was contemplated by the original act. But so it is, 50-foot buffer, and NIMS pushed back and said, no, you have to have at least a 100-foot no-cut buffer. And this became a big fight between the two agencies. It's the first time that I've watched that happen. And <clears throat> they call it the escalation, where it started with a letter of non-concurrence from NIMS to the Forest Service uh, locally from a really, there's a really great biologist at NIMS who likes fish a lot. And um, it's great. He should, right? And so that led to all of these meetings and discussions and scientific papers about what the buffer widths should be. And you know, really, in, at the end of the day, one would think that the Forest Service would just defer to the experts on threatened fish, nymphs, but they had to do a lot of political wrangling 
And um, there's a paper about to come out that describes what the conclusions of the escalation were. I hope NIMS won. That would be great. And that, you know, even though I think we should protect the entire riparian reserve, 100 feet is much better than 50. Now I'm going to get into two examples, like really current examples of how all that history, the three branches of government, and the politics, the economics, and the law all come together in things that are happening kind of right now in terms of Oregon forest politics. And none, none of it's around specific timber sales, and I'm happy to talk at length about jazz or any of the other campaigns we're doing after this. These are really interesting things that have been going on. And the first has to do with that funny little law I told you about in the BLM. Anyone remember the name? The Oregon and California Lands Act. I love this law. I, I full disclaimer, when I was in law school, I wrote like my thesis on this law. I think it's fascinating that I could talk to you for the rest of the night on it. I'll try not to. But it's a really interesting little law. OK. It also has a history. So one of the way it goes also back to colonization like most things here, one of the ways that the federal government wanted to encourage westward expansion was through railroad building. That was a way to get more people out west faster. And so they devised this really interesting land giveaway to railroad companies to help them build the railroads. It went like this. The federal government would give every other square mile of land along the railroad line away to the railroad company and then the railroad company could sell it to bona fide settlers. So it was a way to encourage the railroad company to come by giving away this free land and encourage settlement along the rail line. Well, railroad companies are some of the you know, first great uh, bad corporations in American history. And there was this whole corporate scandal of the railroads taking that land and then selling their every other square mile, not to bona fide settlers, but can you guess who they sold it to? Themselves. No. Timber companies. timber companies. Right you are, Dan. They sold them to timber companies. So all along these rail lines, this land that was supposed to go to settlement was getting sold to timber companies, and often for much higher than the value that they were. They had a statutory amount that they had to sell it to settlers. But if they sold it to timber companies, you know, I mean, they were already breaking the law, so they sold it for way more. Now again, the people of Oregon, the good people of Oregon have long been very progressive. And you know, back then, there was a whole thing called the Oregon system. This was in the 1930s. The Oregon system included uh, ballot initiatives and referendums, born in, port, in, born in Oregon, and uh, prohibition, another thing. Those two kind of went together. It was the Oregon system. And if, if you are all interested in a fascinating person in Oregon history, I suggest you read the biography of William U. Wren. He's the guy who got ballot initiatives and referendums started. He's fascinating. But there was a lot of progressive politics just like bubbling up in Oregon at that time, and people were upset. They're like, these lands are being sold to timber companies in this corporate scandal, and we're mad. And so the people of Oregon got took a case all the way to the Supreme Court against the Oregon and California Railroad because of its collusion with timber companies. And the Supreme Court ducked the issue altogether. They're like, yeah, this was totally wrong, but we're not going to come up with a remedy. We're going to ask Congress, what do we do with this land now? What do you do with A, the land that the Oregon and California Railroad has but hasn't disposed of, and B, the land that it has disposed of? Can we get it back? You know, so there was this whole question on all of this land that the Oregon and California Railroad Company had or had illegally disposed of, what do you do with it? So Congress passed in 1937 the Oregon and California Lands Act, which was at its time really forward-thinking, conservation-oriented law. It was one of the first multiple-use laws, and it said, all right, this land is to be managed for sustained timber yield recreation and watershed protection. Which I think was pretty, pretty brilliant back then. And so it got transferred to the General Land Office, not the National Forest Service. That's what Congress did. Now remember how I said the General Land Office then became the BLM. So the only place in the country where the BLM has a substantial timber program is in Western Oregon. And so it's kind of its own beast. Um, 
Unfortunately, the Oregon and California Lands Act has not always been interpreted as a, as a conservation-oriented multiple-use statute. It, the, the, that first word, sustained timber yield, has become kind of the, the dominant cry, the way that people understand and interpret the law. I think they're wrong from a legal perspective, but that's, that's what's happened. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals actually said, it's a timber, it's just timber, just log that land. So that's how it's been managed by the BLM. Those three different um, goals can be in direct conflict. Yeah. And they, they can work together if you do specific land designations. But if you just say, oh wow, timber is the dominant management, which is the way they've been managed, the other two have fallen a lot away. Um, so a lot of Southern Oregon has been logged really heavily by the BLM focused on that piece. However, that stopped in 1994 because the Northwest Forest Plan that I referred to that Clinton did, did a very bold thing and it lumped the Forest Service and the BLM together and said, we are creating one overarching plan that applies to both land designations. And so that put the brakes on the BLM's timber dominant program for a long time. Now, remember what I said about county payments back when? How much counties get, what percentage of timber receipts they get? 25%. However, in Oregon and California lands, ONC lands as they're called, it's 50%. There are 19 counties that make up, in Oregon, that make up the association of ONC counties. And let me tell you, that association really likes logging on federal lands. They get 50% of the timber receipts. And so that created county economies that were wholly dependent on logging and BLM lands. Yeah, question. Did that 2% uh, change a couple of years ago? Nope, the 50% has remained constant. What has changed is the amount of logging has decreased wildly. But Congress stepped in, Ron Wyden and his, his buddies in Congress in 2000s said, well, you know, some rural counties are in real dire straits because they're not getting money from the timber industry. So we're going to pass essentially a federal welfare bill called the Secure Rural Schools and Self-Determination Act. And we're going to give them money, we're just going to give them money tied to the amount that they used to get from timber receipts so they can kind of pull themselves together. It was a, considered a, a stopgap measure so that these counties could figure out how to sustain themselves not dependent on the timber receipts that would never come again. I mean, most of the timber, it was like old growth timber just being cut, especially in the 70s and 80s. The forest just couldn't sustain that. So the Secure Rural Schools Act was created as a stopgap. And since then, it's been reauthorized again and again and again. And every time it looks like it's not going to be reauthorized, the rural counties are like, hey, we need this money. We need this money. Oh, please give us the money or start logging a lot again. And um, Maybe you all heard, especially this past fall and winter, both Peter DeFazio, the representative in the Eugene area, and Senator Wyden came up with their own plans to solve the crisis of ONC lands. Both of them included massively increasing logging on ONC lands, removing a lot of the environmental protections that are common to the ONC lands because of the Northwest Forest Plan. Basically, trying to throw back to the pre-Northwest Forest Plan amounts of logging. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, those lands are not, you know, a lot of them are people's watersheds. A lot of them, amazingly, there's still low elevation old growth in Southern Oregon on ONC lands. Now, remember how I talked about you about the piece by piece nature? The thing about ONC lands is it's not like one big chunk. It's like this little bit, and this little bit, and this little bit, and this little bit, interspersed by private lands and people's homes, especially in Southern Oregon. I lived in, in Williams in Southern Oregon for a while, and our backyard was BLM ONC lands. You know, and it's very much like that in that area. So an increased logging has a lot more of a direct impact on the people there than even the logging in national forest lands for most of us, because it's like one large chunk that's farther away. Also, though, if you look at kind of the politics and economics of this, the idea that these lands could sustain the same level of cut and produce the same amount of jobs and money as they were in the 1980s for these counties is 
crazy, <laughs> not very far thinking. And there are luckily some really good economists in Oregon who are looking at the economic value of the land from logging and mill jobs, which again, most are now mechanized, and comparing that to the amount that comes in from recreation and from clean drinking water and things like that, which are far greater economic services from the public lands. So even though Wyden and DeFazio both spent a lot of their personal capital on moving forward a solution to these bills, they're kind of not going anywhere in Congress right now, which is great. Um, one reason is that Senator Wyden is no longer the chair of the Natural Resources Department, or committee, which he was. And he moved to the Finance Committee. Um, and now someone from Louisiana who doesn't have as much investment in solving the federal lands problems in Oregon is the chair. But here, I think it raises an interesting question. Should federal lands be the breadbasket for the local county? It's, it's right next to them. In one way, the land, you know, the land doesn't know that it's federal versus county. You don't, you know, you walk the invisible line. But I think it's a really live question in a lot of policy is who should get the benefit from lands designated as pub federal public lands? Should it be the local people who live right next to it? Or should we consider them as part of the kind of resource bank for everyone in this country? I don't have an answer to that. I think it's a very live and interesting question. Just going to throw that one out. We know that the federal government's timber sale program loses money every year. The general accounting office of the federal government, the GAO, did an audit about four years ago that found the millions of dollars, I don't have that number off the top of my head, were lost annually in the federal timber sale program. So it's pretty clear that Congress and its appropriations bill subsidizes the Forest Service to plan these timber sales, and they put all the money into planning it, and then they sell the, maybe the value of the wood, but it doesn't reflect at all the value of the planning. And the question of you know, who repairs the damage a lot of it doesn't get repaired, you know, and so that just becomes kind of like an externality of the timber sale program. So when a road wasn't made well and it slides into the river, the company who made the road isn't held responsible for it. You know, and it's something that Bark has done a lot of recently is go back to areas that have been logged and monitor to them to see if timber companies complied with all of their contract standards, the best management practices, and more often than not, we find that they haven't, and that they've left roads open that should be closed, or they've taken trees that were not in their contract to be taken, or things like that. But the Forest Service is not aggressive at implement, uh, enforcing their contracts, and we, as third parties who aren't part of the contract, cannot enforce the contract. All we can do is gather the information and then share it, and you know, try and create enough sense of outrage that things change. So I'll, I'll get to organizing in, in a minute. And the jazz timber sale that I've referred to several times, Bark has taken a particular interest in because it's planned in the single most unstable watershed in all of Mountain National Forest. A lot of it's on high-risk earth flows, areas where the land is known to be moving. And so when you put a road across it or you log it, you destabilize the, the soil, the soil networks. So yeah, who pays for it? The, the salmon. <laughs> really, um, it's not a it's not a tight system, and it doesn't have a lot of good feedback loops, especially economically. You know, since the GAO did their report, the Forest Service budgets are becoming more and more obscure. They just passed a new budgeting uh, approach where every line item that they used to have in terms of resource management just they all got lumped into one, and so you're not able to track where the money is going at all anymore, as, the, as a member of the public. Um, the budget's really hard to crack. And now it's even harder because it's all one lump sum. It's like, if you made your own personal budget and you were just like, expenses, and it was, it was that's just what you just expenses, and you just had a number, or, you know, it's, it makes it very hard to know exactly where money is going to. So, I wanted to, to highlight the Oregon-California Lands Act because that is something that's been really up in Oregon, and it's a way that how the history and the politics and the economics all come together in a strange, like local but federal issue. Then there's another thing that's happened since then, 
that I also want to highlight because it's cha it's, it, it has the potential to change the nature of public engagement on almost every single timber sale that we're facing. Um, it used to be that the Forest Service would make a decision and then you would appeal the decision. You knew what the decision was. You'd say, I really think you made a bad decision. And then they would have to meet with you and see if you could resolve it. And then there was this little rider that someone wrote, it wasn't even the Forest Service, they were taken surprise, as was the environmental community, that said, appeals are so 1990s. We're just done with them. We are now going to have pre-decisional objections. You don't get to know what the decision is, you just have to object to it before you know. And then the Forest Service can correct its mistakes and then go forward. So attached to a bill was the appropriations bill. It had to pass. Like it was the money to you know, fund all the budgets. There's this little writer, and people do these about everything. All sorts of crazy things. They're not debated. People don't read them. They just like tack on all these little writers to bills that have to pass. It's like the salvage writer that I talked about. I mean, that bill had to pass. And uh, boom, you get a little something that changes the whole law. And so that was the first. We lost the right to appeal decisions. And you know, then the Forest Service spent the past year trying to figure out what that actually means. And we're just coming into a phase of trying it on, trying these pre-decisional objections on. So that was the first thing that happened last year. We're like, oh wow, that's a game changer, all right. Enter into the farm bill that passed, and, and perhaps this is even worse because it was debated and discussed, but remember the Forest Service is in the Department of Agriculture. So things pertaining to the Forest Service get put into the farm bill. And the things that happen in this farm bill, oh, <sighs> all right. Remember how I said with NEPA, there are projects that are likely to significantly impact things, and then there's ones that aren't? Well, if you're not likely to significantly impact, it's analyzed in something called an environmental assessment. If it is likely to significantly impact, it's an environmental impact statement. But there's a third category. For things that are likely to have no impact at all, those are just called categorically excluded. There are a lot of things that the Forest Service has to do, or the federal government has to do, every agency has its list of categorically excluded things. They're like, every now and then we X, and whatever X is, it really isn't a big deal. Like, we cut down hazard trees that are leaning over access roads. You know, they don't have to go through a whole notice and comment if they're going to cut down a hazard tree that's leaning over an access road, or things like this. Obviously, the agency really likes categorical exclusions. It gives them the ability to act without going through all the analysis. So the list of things that are categorically excluded has kind of grown. And it, the, the assumption is these things don't have an environmental impact. There, there's no way they could be likely to significantly impact. So we don't really have to give them much analysis. So the Farm Bill just passed uh, with a clause that said timber sales, 3,000 acres or less, can now go forward with a categorical exclusion to NEPA if A, they're meant to reduce the risk of disease or fire, and B, approved by a collaborative group. Because those two things would mean they have no likelihood of significantly impacting the forest. So we're in a situation where we might lose the ability to even get environmental assessments for most of the timber sales that happen because Mount Hood National Forest has yet to even plan a timber sale larger than 3,000 acres. They don't plan timber sales that big. And they used to do EISs for them. But under the Farm Bill, it now says you can just categorically exclude them. All you have to do is say this is to prevent insects or fire, which you can say about anything. Insects and fire are always eating up the forest. It's great. It's how the forest changes. It's how it transforms. It's the death and rebirth cycle of the forest. But there is a lot of rhetoric around restoration that involves logging, commercial logging for restoration, and uh, expediting it. And if you, depending on who you read and what science you believe, there's a really dominant narrative that our federal forests are unhealthy, they're overstocked, they've been fire suppressed, and the only thing we can do to save the forests is log them. And so we don't want environmental laws standing in the way of us restoring the forests. It's a very dominant narrative. 
and has caused a lot of consternation in the environmental community because there's many environmental groups who are pushing that. There are many national environmental groups who are behind the pieces in the Farm Bill. Nature Conservancy, primarily. They have joined the dark side. They weren't already on it, they now are, completely. And, um, and it's really too bad because all of us groups who are on the ground, who are dealing with these issues locally, who get out there and see the forests before and after, we know that this rhetoric of restoration is not accurate. It's not true. We also know that forests have been greater at self-regulating for thousands of years, millions, since forests have been forests. And this new piece of the farm bill basically acts that the, the emergency of the need to restore the forests should come before any environmental analysis and public input and participation. That just passed two, three months ago. So we're now starting to see it being implemented. And we haven't yet seen it. Mountain and National Forest, we're expecting it to come. Um, the collaborative groups that currently exist aren't high functioning. The collaborative groups is something that's emerged also in the past about 10 years, which is the idea that if we can get diverse stakeholders together, get the industry and the environmental groups and, and the local watershed councils together, all talking together and working together, we can make good decisions for forest management. And BARC has participated in some and has found it effective when we were all focused on the type of restoration that is known to be effective, like removing roads. You know, we worked with the Clackamas Stewardship Partners to plan a lot of road decommissioning in the Clackamas River watershed. It's the, the, the most beneficial type of restoration action you can do in the West Side Forest is just get rid of the roads, because they're really the, the biggest problem. But when kind of turned the corner and the dominant narrative became the type of restoration we need to do means logging, and to do that logging we actually need to build roads. Bark said, I don't think we can collaborate with you anymore. You know, we've, we've got some standards here. And so we have taken a step back from the group. But it's scary that those are the groups who are now going to look at these 3,000 acre or greater or, or less timber sales and let them go forward under no analysis. So that's another thing that kind of comes out of the political wrangling, and the economics, and uh, a lot of it is, is mythology. It's, it, it might be like this in any policy. You know, I know forest policy best, but it might be that policy is informed more by myth than anything else. You know, when I see how the dominant narrative actually has very little to do with the scientific underlines or what's on the ground, and see the divorce there, it's kind of clear that you know, these stories that we create are the things with the most power, which leads me to what can we do about it? You know, I used to give a NEPA training. I was like, what you can do about it is you can, you can read the EAs and you can comment on them and then the agency will believe you and it'll change things and all will be well. Because there was a time that that worked. And there might be specific times when that's still a really effective tool. Engaging with the, the tools in the system. And you know, this, a, as an attorney, I bump into this sometimes. I'm like, oh, I fundamentally don't believe that the system works and yet I'm going to engage with the tools of the system and push it to see what happens. Lately, the feedback I've been getting more than anything is just organize, just, just organize, change the stories, because we are losing ground in environmental law and policy, like right and left, just losing ground. At a time when the kind of whole fate of the ecosystem is more in question than ever, shouldn't be a time where it feels like we're losing so much ground, where our laws are being eroded, where our politicians are you know, relying on rhetoric from the 1980s to push for more logging. And so now, giving these you know, workshops, the main thing I wanna focus on is how we organize to change the narrative around what public lands are for, who public lands are for. And looking at the history, saying like, you know, seeing how they've been used, who's benefited, who's lost, and changing that. And so one thing that we're doing at BARC, which is really important, is starting to talk about how, what would real restoration look like on our public lands, and how can we get behind something that, ooh, even though sometimes I'm still having a hard time saying it, that creates jobs and is really good for the environment. 
You know, I've, I've long been of the ilk, like, let's just focus on what's good for the environment. But I know that the dominant narrative needs to include jobs to get political support. And what we've been looking at, again, is road decommissioning. There's 4,000 4, miles of roads in Mount Hood National Forest. 4,000 miles of roads. You could drive to Florida if you strung them all out. It's crazy. You know, the, the US Forest Service is the largest road manager in the world. You could drive to the moon and halfway back on Forest Service roads. It's crazy. And they only have a budget to upkeep about 20% of their road system. So they're in a multi-billion dollar maintenance backlog nationally. Mount Hood National Forest, their maintenance backlog increases by over a million dollars every year. And those roads are just chronic sources of sediment and they cut through wildlife habitat. They create vectors for invasive species to go in and invasive humans on ATVs and other things, you know, bring their couches up to the forest and shoot them up. Do all sorts of funny things up there. Um, and so Bark has been really focused on how do we create a narrative around restoration that actually addresses the problem on the ground and isn't couched in, we just need to log more. And roads aren't as sexy as saving old growth trees. You know, you can take someone to an old growth tree and be like, this is going to be clear cut. And they're like, oh my gosh, I will help. You go see a road, you're like, this road's really bad. Like every year it just drains dirt into the creek. And you can't get a, a visceral reaction to that. But the more I learn, the more I am with the forest, the more I realize like, it might be more subtle work that we're doing. You know, Mount Hood National Forest isn't clear cutting old growth anymore. We stopped that. That was great. It was really great. But there's this persistent vector of harm that's just there, bleeding itself into the water. And so we're shifting the narrative to roads and starting to really organize around it. And so that can happen on any political issue, any environmental issue, you find out really what a story is that you can get behind that, you know, in here we're not even, we're not even directly um, antagonistic to the story of logging. We're just shifting it all together. We're like, what we need to focus on is removing roads. This is how we do it. This is how many jobs are created. This is why it's beneficial to everyone. And just kind of sideswiping the entire discussion around to log or not to log. I mean, we'll engage as needed. But it's an interesting move into creating a different story and a different narrative that we can get a really diverse group of stakeholders behind. Because, you know, Bark's tired of hearing, I mean, the Forest Service is tired of hearing Bark be like, don't log, don't log. They're like, yeah, we know Bark, we know. You don't want us to log, we know we're not listening anymore. So when that door really shut, we're having to figure out how to get around. And so I'd encourage all of you who are thinking about how to engage in you know, policy work of any kind to figure out like what's the most compelling story that you can get yourself behind and start telling it and telling it to other people. Because at the end of the day, that's what all these laws are in some ways. They're just like stories we inscribe onto the landscape. And so we want to shift those and change them and have, you know, create more breathing room for the forest itself. So thank you everyone for coming. This is, you know, it's, it's dense stuff, but it's definitely knowable, and, and it's a great group of people who do the work, even if the work itself is sometimes utterly depressing. Um, you still have the forest to go to and get regenerated in, and amazing people to do the work with. So, yeah, thanks, and thanks, David. <laughs>